September Health Equity Workgroup meeting. Um, if you are new to the the work group, please, 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 well, all of you, everybody, please uh, introduce yourself in the chat. But if you are new, especially, we'd love to hear from you um, and let us know who you are and where you're from. Um, and if you're not affiliated with an organization, we know some people do join as um, interested residents of the county. Please let us know that as well. We don't bite. All right, I see a couple of people introducing themselves in the chat. A variety of places. Well, thank you and welcome. Well, today, um, and look, maybe we're just for the interest of time, just go on. So today we're going to have a discussion about the community health assessment um, data. So if you were some people, many of us were not able to join the work the monthly, not the quarterly meeting of the Prince George's Healthcare Action Coalition, um, where there was a discussion of um, the community health assessment. And so we thought it would be great to bring that to some of the work groups, or not we, but thank you, Taylor, for bringing that discussion here to the work group to include and bring that discussion here to a different group. Um, it sounds like many of us were not able to attend, myself included, it was back to school night. Um, so we thought uh, that this would be really a working meeting, um, and we spend a lot of time doing that. We will do community announcements in general, but I do note that there is at least one um, community announcement. Uh, we have a participant who's not able to join at the end to stay th the entire meeting and wanted to, to join and share something right before we get started. Oh, yes. Hi. My name is Asohe. I'm a student at the University of Maryland College Park, and I'm here representing my Gemstone Honors Program research team, Team Black Women's Matter. We're currently, um, our research is focused on looking into the maternal mortality rate for Black mothers in Prince George's County and trying to understand how patient provider interactions play a role in that. And to that end, we have two survey to research groups necessarily. Um, so we're looking at mothers and trying to understand their birthing experience, giving birth in hospitals in and around the county, because we know a lot of mothers actually give birth in Silver Spring or DC. And then we're also looking at providers. So this ranges from doulas to OBGYNs, really anybody that is impacting a mother's pregnancy journey. We're looking for them and we're trying to understand how their medical school curriculum or the curriculum they you know, learn while in training for their program impacts how they interact with their patients. So to that end, I'm here asking for your help in disseminating this information to your contacts, to your groups, if you know of any Black mothers, if you know of any providers that are working with pregnant women, we would love to get their feedback and their insights so that we have something that we can share at future um, Health Action Coalition meetings and also to the Prince George's County Health Department. If anyone has any questions, I'll be here till around like 3.50, so I can always answer questions in the chat or right now. Thank you, and are you, because I, I see that there's a QR code, um, but if we are on our work on our laptops, do, uh, are you able to drop the link to a flyer or anything um, or a website or anything of that nature so that we can disseminate? And I know, Taylor, you usually send this out afterwards, um, but while we have people's attention, it would be great oh, to. Yes, yeah, so we now. do have a survey toolkit and I will link, I'll post the link in the chat as well, but I can send Taylor the survey toolkit and I'll post the link to the surveys in the chat very shortly. All right, awesome. Thank you. And one of one other question: What sort of time frame are you looking to receive um, responses to the survey? So right now we're shooting to get as many responses as we can by October. But one thing that we know is that it takes a lot of time for people to get the information. So we're really trying to put all, all hands on deck at the moment and try to get as many by October. Good afternoon. This is Shanika with Prince George's County Health Department. 
um, administrative care coordination program and our targeted population are the pregnant women of Prince George's County. So we will be sharing your um, survey, but my question is, um, is it okay for them to be undocumented women of color? As long as they are a black woman, pregnant okay. or postpartum, their immigration status, insurance status does not matter. All right, thank you so much. I will be sharing. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Asahe? All right, well, thank you so much for joining. Um, what I heard is that you'll be here until around 3.50. So if anybody else has other questions, feel free to reach out to us in the in the chat. Um, and that is, yeah, I see you were the last person to enter your information. So thank you. This sounds exciting and good luck. All right. Um, Next, so then for the majority of this meeting today, we did want to uh, talk about the community health assessments and talk about data and get a, more information from you all, um, from all of your individual perspectives uh, throughout the county. We all come from, we have different ideas. Um, as, as we know, the community health needs assessment is important. It's important to get as many voices as possible. So with that, um, Taylor and Deborah Collier, I, I will let you lead the discussion. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, hello, everyone. For those who I have not met yet, my name is Taylor Palmer, and I'm a health policy analyst within the health department. I'm specifically situated in the Office of Assessment and Planning. And so part of my job, I help to manage the uh, Prince George's County Healthcare Action Coalition and all of our work groups. And the other half of my job is to assist in the development of the community health assessment and the community health improvement plan. So as the Prince George's County Health Department is underway in the uh, plan of the 2025 Community Health Assessment. We are bringing up these discussions with all of our work groups and all of our community partners. As Christine mentioned today, our discussion is going to focus majority around the quantitative data piece. Um, but as you probably know, uh, the, the community health assessment is fueled by both the quantitative as well as the qualitative data piece. So we want to open up the discussion today from all of you as content, content experts from many fields and also in the realm of health equity to be able to tell the community's whole story, to be able to get at the root causes of, of inequities instead of just naming inequities to get to the root causes of those inequities through the community health assessment. So our discussion today, we have an interactive activity for you all. We're going to be taking a look at um, some specific data indicators that we've previously used in the 2022 community health assessment and that we've been tracking to assess the health of Prince George's County. And um, before we do that, though, we're going to take a look at the state health improvement plan to see the indicators that the Maryland Department of Health is using to uh, track health and to measure their um, top five leading health priorities for the state. So hopefully throughout that discussion, we'll be able to um, brainstorm better indicators. If your organization is specifically tracking indicators or if you know of indicators specifically um, for in the different areas that we're going to discuss today, uh, please do feel free to, um, to add those to our discussion and to tell us some more about that. Again, we want to tell as uh, comprehensive of a story as possible, and so we hope that um, you all can contribute to that today. And so to give us a little bit of background, um, for those who were able to join us back in June during our quarterly meeting, we presented on uh, NACHO's MAP 2.0 process that's mobilizing through action uh, policies and practice and partnerships. Um, they have, they outlined three assessments that are critical to, to the community health assessment. So uh, starting with community partners, this is a survey that we'll actually be sending out to all of our community partners uh, very soon asking about um, 
all of the great work that you do, all of the populations served, what are some barriers to the services that you provide in Prince George's County? We want to know all of that as we put together this community health assessment. While the community health assessment is an opportunity for us to discuss the needs of Prince George's County, we also want to give mention to the assets of, of the county and all of the resources that we do have currently that are working to address the leading health priorities. So that survey will be coming out in a few weeks. Um, next, we have the community status assessment. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. That is more of the quantitative data piece. So that includes assessing health outcomes, risk factors, uh, the social determinants of health, and again, getting at those root causes of health inequities. And so that's where we're hoping we'll be able to focus our discussion in today and talking about some of those um, quantitative data indicators. Of course, we know um, within the community health assessment that community context and lived experience is equally, if not more important um, to being able to tell a comprehensive story of um, health and well-being here in Prince George's County. And so um, that will include focus groups with our community partners, with community residents as we, um, as we continue through the community health assessment process. And so again, um, the community partners will be reaching out to you all very soon with that assessment. We're going to focus in on this quantitative piece and the um, community context is also coming up in just a few short months. And so next, as I mentioned, the uh, Maryland Department of Health, they recently uh, released their state health improvement plan. So they have named five leading health priorities. So the five leading health priorities are chronic disease, access to care, behavioral health, women's health, and it's not on the slide, but um, women's health and violence prevention. And so here we can see for each of the leading health priorities, they've outlined um, some specific uh, action items that they have, some specific objectives, some specific goals of what they're going to address under each umbrella, under each priority. So for chronic disease is to enhance primary prevention of chronic disease, as well as screening, treatment, and care. And so um, listed below in, in the bulleted list, you can see all of the indicators that the Maryland Department of Health is going to be tracking to assess that health priority. Um, same for access to care. So for access to care, Maryland Department of Health is seeking to enhance care delivery models, recruit a high quality workforce and reduce barriers to care. And so um, again, you can see some of those um, indicators that are being used to assess access to care. So for example, the proportion of statewide behavioral health outpatient service recipients who receive services via te telehealth. Um, we There's mention of the school-based health centers, um, who uh, populations who have primary care providers, average wait time for um, for accessing primary care, that first appointment. And then next we have uh, behavioral health, which um, MDH is seeking to expand access to and utilization of behavioral health services, reduce disparities and mental health outcomes, reduce overdose and negative health outcomes, associated with substance use. And so we did this similar exercise yesterday with our behavioral health advisory group. And with that work group, we focused specifically in on behavioral health and um, focusing on um, looking beyond a crisis model and some of the indicators that we need to better assess behavioral health as we integrate it into somatic care. And so that group um, took the indicators that we have here and they also gave some ideas for um, looking at uh, behavioral health uh, checks during annual well visits. And also uh, there's discussion here from the state about utilization of public behavioral health services. But the advisory group yesterday brought up the utilization of um, private behavioral health services and, a, and that being a possible indicator that we should also consider. 
So what we're asking for you all today is to take the information that we have here, and I also have information from our 2022 community health assessment, and we're asking you to consider what other indicators do we need to consider, especially as we think about this through a health equity lens and telling the most comprehensive community story here in Prince George's County, what do we need to include? What do we need to include in this quantitative piece? And also what should we consider in the qualitative piece? All of this that we discussed today will be a part of a much bigger exploration as we take a look at analyzing the quantitative data, but then also as we plan out those um, facilitation guides for the focus groups. So before I move on, I know I just threw a lot of information at you. Does anyone have any uh, reactions or any questions? Dr. Bauer. Thanks, Taylor. Um, so I guess my question is, because so this is um, when did the when did these state priorities come out? They came out uh, last week, actually. Last week, okay. Um, because I know I had been in conversation with them about health literacy being included in the state health priority. So I'm not sure if it's just in the report now, or if they decided not to include it, I hadn't seen this list, but like specifically on this issue of behavioral health, right? I know like on the, in the UMD context, mental health is like one of the top issues that the campus is addressing for the campus community and things. But yet we have survey data that says, you know, about only about 15% of US adults have ever heard of the 988, uh, you know, hotline, which has had actually tremendous promotion, right? So that's a little bit concerning, I think, given the amount of effort that's been put into promoting that 988 line and consolidating that as a one-stop shop to get people out. So I just wonder, um, you know, this coalition in particular has always been very sensitized to health literacy as being a priority issue for the county. So I'm just wondering, where do you think that enters into this process? Because I didn't see it represented in that circle diagram. And since it's not listed here in the categories from the state, you know, where, um, where do you think it sort of fits into this assessment process? Yes, um, considering, considering the MAP 2.0 process and, and the, the commitment again to equity and um, revising the process to be very specific to the population. That's something that we're going to be looking at and uh, consulting with the Center for Health Literacy. And, you know, that's why we wanted to bring up this discussion today to start thinking through indicators and, um, of course, bringing folks to the table to talk about our process and to, um, to make sure that health literacy as a, is at the forefront of our efforts. I mean, because I think, you know, my, my, concern across the counties, right? It's not specific to any one county is that, you know, since we're aware of a lot of services that are being provided in a lot of, you know, communities across the state, but awareness still remains a primary challenge. And that's not something that most community health assessments have really been set up to try and assess, right? To collect data on, whether that's through their community surveys or having data from a systems perspective. And so, I'm really hoping that Prince George's can be a leader in showing how to do that so that other counties can kind of get on board with this, that it just becomes a routine part of how the counties think about doing community data collection. Um, because I, ju I, I just, I get concerned that there's going to be a lot of effort on more programs and more services without considering how are people going to learn about those programs and services, as well as understand which ones are for them and how to choose among them, right? Because that's always an issue too, is like there could be three or four options, but how do people figure out which one's gonna be the best one for them? So I appreciate you guys putting that on the radar because I really think that um, a lot of programs, you know, there's so much emphasis always on the programs and less about people understanding what's <laughs> available and how to get to them. Yes, and that's something we'll be considering when we take a look at that community context assessment, you know, as we're having these focus groups and we're asking about the availability of programs, also asking about the accessibility of those programs. So we know so many factors go into the overall accessibility of the programs um, and getting at some of those, what are the, what are the key drivers that are barriers 
um, to accessing to accessing the programs, and we'll be able to take that back as well and um, have um, be informed. The process informed also by our care coordination team. Those folks um, are CHWs who are on the ground and who are working working with clients and who are seeing these barriers in real time and can also um, help communicate and inform the process. Any additional comments or questions? All right, and next, this resource also came from the state. So in uh, developing the state health improvement plan, um, the state reached out and conducted a partner survey as well as a community input survey. And so here are the results from the community input survey. There were about 350 responses from uh, Prince George's County and it asked questions. Um, here are three questions that we wanted to highlight um, asking about the most important issues affecting the health and well-being of your community. What are the most important things that make a community healthy? And then asking uh, respondents to rate the overall health of your county. So here's how Prince Georgians who completed the survey, here's how they responded. Um, as you can see, many of our, um, the work that we do in the work group uh, remains, remains a priority, access to healthcare, mental health, chronic diseases, homelessness, affordable housing, gun violence, and then also looking at the important things that make a community healthy. Again, access to affordable health care, access to safe and affordable housing, healthy and affordable food, many of the social determinants of health that we know. And so all of that informs informs what we what we will move forward um, during this process, keeping all of this in mind. And so as we um, continue, we'll be doing our own surveying of partners and seeking community input, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, but I just wanted to present this all to you all in case you haven't seen it, um, just so you can all see um, how respondents um, reported and the state health improvement plan. And so next, as I mentioned, um, we we have been collecting uh, information on all of the indicators that we use in our previous community health assessment. So in the 2022 iteration of the CHA. And so um, here were the areas uh, where we had data indicators. Uh, these are very broad categories. So there are specific subtopics under categories that may, you may not see here, but you may see um, in a few minutes. So, for example, health literacy may be one that um, we see within some of these higher level topics. Um, but as you can see here are um, the topics that we did focus in on the, in the 2022 health assessment and that we had indicators for um, all are included in the state health priorities. And as you all know, our work groups um, all address these data measures, all these topics. So today what we're going to do with the interactive activity is we're gonna go deeper into each of these topics and we're gonna take a look at the indicators that we previously tracked in the 2022 community health assessment, um, consider what is being tracked at the state level and consider what gaps are there in our understanding. What do we need to be measuring um, to make sure that we are telling the most comprehensive story that we can here in Prince George's County. And so with that being said, as we go through the exercise uh, to ground us, uh, if folks could consider these questions, these two questions that we have. So first, what topics, data sources, or matrices do would be beneficial to include? And does your organization collect data that would contribute to telling the community story? And so to do so, we are going to have a live poll. If folks are able to join on their on their mobile devices, or if you'd like to join on, um, on your computer, you can either scan the QR code or you can go to slido.com and you'll be asked to enter this seven digit code. The code is 2720446.
and are folks having any challenges accessing the poll? So as folks join, this is going to be um, an open response, so you can type as many characters as you wish. Um, the question that we are asking, what other indicators and data sources could be included to better assess access to care? And so over on the left here, you'll see we have, we have two tables uh, for access to care. These are the previous data indicators that we used in the 2022 community health assessment. So that includes residents with health insurance by race, ethnicity, sex, age group, and trends. Um, we also have adults who had a routine checkup in the last year, residents with a usual pr primary care provider, and resident to provider ratios. And down below are also um, the state health improvement plan indicators that we just went over. But our question to you all is, what is missing and what could we include to better assess access to care? And if you all are were having any trouble seeing what was in the, the Slido, because uh, I was, I discovered that you can actually, there's a magnifying glass within there. I was not able to see on either screen. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. So far, we have proximity to care, census data on languages spoken at home and country of birth, number of uninsured persons, number of providers, Medicaid enrollment, pediatric patients waitlisted for behavioral health outpatient services. We'll keep that in mind as well for our behavioral health section. Percent seeking care outside of the county. That listens carefully, shows respect, and explains things enough that patients understand. Frequent ED utilizers, emergency room wait times, number of residents enrolled accessing MD SHIP program. Would anyone like to expand on any of the ideas that they've added to, to the poll?
Tammy, I see your hand. Thank you. So I had included uh, two different things. I included the um, number of uh, providers. Sometimes we um, talk about the, the county, um, you know, people utilizing services outside the county, but I think it's also good to get a number of what do we have within our county? Is it we don't have enough providers in our county is why people are going outside of the county. So to get that number will help to see why people are not utilizing in the county. Um, and then the other part is the um, frequent ED utilizers. So a lot of people that frequent the emergency room is either because of insurance um, issues or they do not have a primary care provider. So they're not utilizing uh, preventative services and then they're going to the emergency room frequently and not and sometimes it has to do with social determinants of health. You know, they don't have access to uh, pharmacy or they are on insulin and they can't afford it and things like that. But just understanding that data can also uh, help feed into what the needs are. And Anya? Good afternoon, everybody. Just to piggyback on what was just said, I also think that's really important. And it's important also to segregate and separate between different types of services, different types of providers, right? And overall, I guess, um, uh, you know, like facilities, because we have issues with access to not just primary care, but also specialty care, behavioral health, you know, like dentists, it's kind of like all across. And in addition to that, when we look at the facilities, you know, like just looking at the Huron report that, um, uh, you know, like we have issues not only with physicians, but with hospital beds. In addition, we have issues with long term care facilities, right? So I think it's just important to identify all of those different gaps because sometimes when we lump all care together into a single category, we forget that it is so uniquely multifaceted and, es and essentially we have gaps throughout the whole system. Thank you. Um, hi, I just wanted to also piggyback, um, even though eligibility is one of the major um, access, access to care issues, but transportation is also a major barrier. And um, with the non-emergency medical transportation, we do transport to um, clients, but there are a significant amount of clients that get denied our services. So um, that would be a great resource to um, to pull their, da their data on the reasons of denials. And also with the ACCU, they receive referrals from non-compliant and questions about access to care. And their questions are very vast from trying to locate specialists, to the nearest providers and how to utilize and, and navigate the Medicaid system itself. So, and they have great data also. Hi, this is Sharon Gibbs Cooper. And I think another key area, just to piggyback on what others have said, is the location. Um, and as everyone has mentioned, um, when we look at geo access, not everyone has that particular provider in need within the parameter, especially the scope of uh, lack of transportation to access. And as one uh, individual mentioned earlier, we have individuals delivering outside of the county. And that was, you know, there's a combination of reasons for that, one of which, you know, proximity, uh, other of which is uh, confidence and trust. So I think those are the areas uh, that we can use as far as building uh, the infrastructure to effectively address those particular areas. And then, of course, what Dr. Bauer had said earlier, it's the health literacy. How do I know about these services within my region? And, of course, the case management or uh, managing a coordination of uh, care uh, is a very important element as far as driving those individuals to uh, attaining the care in the appropriate setting at the appropriate time. Good afternoon. This is Amira from the um, Department of Family Services. 
uh, Aging and Disability Services, and I offered the number of people who participate in um, accessing SHIP, which is the State Health Insurance Assistance Program. It's a volunteer coordinated program to assist people with selecting the best Medicare plans for their use. And um, it coincides with open enrollment. So it's getting ready to go through a very busy season. It's a statewide program. So there's 23 different data sets. But in Prince George's County, of course, people are calling for assistance on how to navigate Medicare. And um, not every plan is available in every area or every county. So I think it would be important to understand who selects what based on it's a based on some of the things that have been shared here but also just knowing that this is a public volunteer run effort to educate people on their health care options while participating in in medicare plans And Temi, did you have something to add? Did I miss your hand earlier? Yes, I, I took it down because what I wanted to say was the part about CAP region. Um, I wanted to say that it would be interesting to see um, to see their data, the number of women that have utilized it. So we know for very for a very long time there wasn't a birth, birthing place within the county, um, and then when CAP region opened up, they do have a a wing, I don't know how many beds, um, but they do have that available now. Uh, it's very new, I believe maybe 2022 was when they opened up. They opened up during COVID, I can't really remember the year. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see how many people, how many women utilize it now that we do have a birthing place within the county, but proximity is part of it as well, because they might be at the way on the end of the county and it's closer to go somewhere else. Uh, but also knowing that insurance plays a big role um, in that as well. If your insurance doesn't utilize, you know, whatever they accept the cap region, um, you're going somewhere else. So, for example, I live in Prince George's County. All three of my babies, I had them at Holy Cross. And the biggest reason was because we were on Kaiser Insurance and Kaiser sends us all to Holy Cross. So we didn't really have a I didn't really have a choice. I had to go to Holy Cross. So that's why I was saying with insurance. So knowing that there are other factors I think it will still be interesting to look at what that data is. Are people even utilizing it even now that it's within the county? Yeah, and I, I just wanted to piggyback on that from personal experience. It's also like where where is your OBGYN credentialed? Are they is that where they're going to send you? Um, is none of mine have ever had any. Uh, they were either in Anne Arundel. Um, or Holy Cross, I think, is one that many people. So there are other, you're right, there are other factors other than people aren't choosing to. It's also there are other limitations placed on the, the individual. I see Dr. Bauer's hands right yeah, I just wanted to kind of piggyback because I periodically ask this question. I actually arrived in the county um, when Cap Region was announced, the build, you know, the build out and the planning and everything. And so I periodically ask the question now that it's open, you know, is the county um, assessing what impact it has had on, you know, overall indicators in the county and um, improvement in various areas because it was touted as making such a huge difference to the county. So I'm just curious if there's been any focused assessment, uh, even on any particular set of services or overall in terms of what difference it has made to the county's health indicators. So. Uh I do have a question as as the health equity work group I and mean, many of us know that it's not also it's not always so if you're talking about health it is not always just we have a provider accessible to us there are many other factors that impact health um that's just one one thing um what I think you know and I saw many of us 
have provided indicators that are largely still focused on clinical access to care. Um, are there others? So, or and Taylor, are there other slides or anywhere else? Um, is that coming somewhere else? Okay, just asking. I also just have a question about um, whether or not it would be appropriate in this space to assess how many residents have access to long-term care insurance. Um, because what ends up, my, my humble ob observation is that people are calling for services, not realizing that they're not covered clearly by Medicare, nor are they covered by just regular private health insurance and long-term care costs are, are astronomical. Um, so how many people actually even have that insurance in the county because those needs going unmet do show up in other places? Thank you for that, Amira. And thank you everyone for your input. I'm going to move to the next slide unless anyone else has anything to add for this, for access to care. Okay, so next we have uh, chronic disease. And so this is again, same question, what other indicators and data sources could be included to better assess chronic disease? Um, as you can see, we have um, quite a few from the 2022 CHA and um, compared to the, the state health improvement plan. But take a look at those and let us know what are we missing? I see the comment here, um, healthy food, grocery store accessibility. That's something that our uh, Healthy Eating Active Living working group, work group has been working on. Um, they created the, previously in 2020 and now in 2024, uh, the healthy food priority areas map. Um, and so that um, gives us more indication using ArcGIS uh, mapping to be able to see nutritional and food deserts across Prince George's County. Chronic disease program data at the health department, so including our uh, diabetes prevention program, Prevention Link, proportion of adults with chronic disease diagnosis who have been counseled on available programs and services, and also considering um, the health literacy piece there. CRISP data on readmissions related to chronic disease. Chronic physical mental trauma or abuse. Disease comorbidity. And does anyone have any ideas they would like to expand on?
Dr. Bauer? I think it was either Healthy People 2010 or 2020, I don't remember which one, used to actually track um, providers counseling people about, um, you know, various topics. Um, and I think those, those objectives have fallen by the wayside over the years. Um, but I think it is, again, goes back to awareness because we were involved in the very early years of Prevention Link. And one of the contributions that we made was to help develop materials that providers could use to talk to patients about programs, right? You know, that there were programs available and the, why they were beneficial and how to enroll and all of, all of that really important information. Um, and I do think that's something that we get asked to weigh in on all the time is to help people with, you know, how to get people um, to understand what the programs are, how to be involved, why they might benefit. So I do think it's worth um, trying to figure out if people have even been offered these programs or, or know how to find information about these programs. Um, because again, it goes, a lot of times programs are just disappointed. You know, we get called in and say like, why is our enrollment low? Or why are we, why can't we attract people to this program? Um, and our first question is always, well, what are you doing to explain what the program is and what the promote, you know, promotion or counseling people about that? So I think that's often overlooked in chronic disease programs. It's like we built the program, it's an evidence-based program, it should work. But again, back to that awareness and promotion, I think that's not typically considered a chronic disease topic, but I think it's really important for the county to kind of get a handle on. Reminds me, um, we have Stephanie Brown today joining us from the uh, community care coordination team. And Stephanie, this reminds us, oh, reminds me of some of the discussions we've had about um, successful referrals and unsuccessful referrals from our mm -hmm. CHWs. And um, you know, we've we've noticed that only a, only a certain percentage are considered successful, and um, clients mm -hmm. are actually following up with those resources. So, taking a look at those barriers again, and seeing, um, you know, from the CHW's point of view, um, you know, having the health literacy discussion, and is it um, are, are folks able to understand in the field when they're you know only have so many minutes to explain the scope of prevention? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. All right, any other reactions or any other comments? All right, well, next we will move on to uh, sexually transmitted infections. So this is something that is not being um, tracked by the Maryland Department of Health, at least in their five uh, leading health, health indicators, uh, health priorities. And so here we just have the um, indicators that we previously have tracked in the 2022 uh, community health assessment. So that includes age adjusted mortality rate for HIV, number of new HIV cases uh, by year, by exposure, total number of living cases by current age, and number of sexual transmitted infections by type, number of selected reportable diseases by year and specifically focusing on syphilis. And for those who have joined us recently, um, if you are able to join the uh, live poll that we have going right now, you can scan the QR code or you can go to slido.com and type in that seven digit code. And we are going through right now and discussing data indicators for the community health assessment and uh, considering gaps and what we need to consider in the 2025 iteration of the CHA. Dr. Gibbs Cooper. Uh, yes, um, in addition to this, I, I think it goes hand in hand with the, not only the outreach and awareness, but the educational component, the literacy. Um, in order to prevent, then we need to educate. 
and educate means meeting people where they are within the community and how accessible is that information, the services. So it's it's a continuum that I think we have to, again, as mentioned earlier, it's an important component that we have to put into all aspects of when we're looking at health promotion and prevention and care. And so um, a common theme here seeing um, if uh, residents who say they know where to find easy to understand sexual health information. And so um, again, uh, not necessarily talking about the quantity of programs, but how folks are able to reach those programs. How are they, how are they getting in the door or what's keeping them from getting in the door? Proportion of county residents who say sexual health is important. National Youth Risk Behavior Survey, YRBS. STI program records and PRISM. Any additional reactions or feedback for, for a discussion of sexually transmitted infections? Routine HIV testing. Clinic availability, again, availability of those education programs. All right, well, we will move on to, um, I'm sorry, does someone unmute? All right, well, we will move on to our next question here, but I'm able to keep this poll active after we end our meeting. So if folks wanna go back to a specific question, feel free to add it or um, certainly email me with any additional feedback you have. All right, and so, and then uh, this this here is uh, broader. So um, what other indicators and data sources could be included to better assess adolescent health? So keep in mind, we've we talked a little bit about um, behavioral health. Um, someone just brought up the YRBS data, um, considering as you take a look at what we've previously included in the 2022 CHA, we have, um, we have, we talk about physical activity, we talk about behavioral health, we talk about the teen birth rate, um, sexual behaviors, alcohol consumption, substance use. Again, what are we, what are we missing here as we think about adolescent populations? seeing here bringing in the conversation that we previously had about um, access to care and discussing insurance insurance amongst adolescents we have overdose and narcan administration rates social media safety number of free or affordable after school program services
number of adolescent including gender specific programs within the school system. Hours per day on social media. Out of curiosity, would um, would anyone like to elaborate on environmental safety? That has been a conversation um, in addressing health amongst adolescents and the difference of generations that grew up being outside and being more active versus a lot of kids of this generation, because one of the basic issues for a lot of children, especially depending on what neighborhoods they live in, they just simply don't feel safe being outside. And so going outside to get physical activity or to simply play is not an option for a lot of people and understandably so their parents don't feel comfortable with them being outside you can't go outside to a playground you can't play in your own yard and so simple things like getting physical activity routinely is not an option so you're limited to what you can get in school and pe in school has been vastly reduced compared to what it was years ago so simple things like just being active is not an option based on how safe you feel in your neighborhood and even for those at home their home environment is not always the safest either so it's something that could still even though it may not seem directly related it still could absolutely impact overall health thanks ashley anya and just to add to that i believe that there are measures in the same uh, survey with regards to percentage percentage of students who have ever had a physical fight, how many feel unsafe on school premises, how many have been bullied on school premises. So once again, there are different ways to gauge that environmental safety, both uh, in school environment as well uh, as potentially at home. See an additional response, ensuring data about LGBTQ plus youth and young adults are collected for each question. And that's something I noticed as well in the state health improvement plan, um, especially when we look at the YRBS data um, and looking at some of the questions for under behavioral health, um, looking at um, responses amongst respondents who identify as LGBTQIA plus um, and considering that across the board for all health topics. Incidents of adolescents receiving mental health care in inpatient settings, something on behavioral health. Availability of school-based clinics. And the Teen National Health Interview Survey. Has anyone had experience with the Teen National Health Interview Survey? Are there specific questions or specific indicators that anyone's had worked with? We next have pre prevalence of anxiety, youth use of 988, and something that actually came up yesterday in our discussion at a behavioral health advisory group meeting. Um, we, we talked about programs and if they're offered to adolescents. So that's something also to consider our mental health programs that we have across the county, but are they specifically only serving adult populations? And if they are actually available to to youth populations and to see that utilization as well. A proportion of youth and young adults who have a trusted adult to talk about health concerns. All right, any other comments before we move on? Skipped. 
All right, next we have what other indicators and data sources could be included to better assess prenatal and infant care? So, so far we have WIC and ACCU data, maternal and child outcomes after one year. And then would someone like to elaborate on, is it um, FIMR data? When in pregnancy, do people have their first prenatal visit? And again, getting at some of those, some of those barriers to our available programs. Proportion of pregnant women who feel confident about initiating, maintaining breastfeeding. Number of individuals requesting WIC and time it takes to receive services. And again, um, having discussion of the available classes, the health education classes for pregnant women, free or affordable classes, and where those are offered throughout the county, if those are concentrated or if those are throughout the county, fetal infant mortality review. Thank you for, thank you for giving context to that acronym. Number of prenatal care visits kept and outcomes. Proportion of pregnant women who say they have a provider who clearly answers their questions about pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum topics. So again, getting at some of those measures that focus on organizational health literacy versus just personal health literacy.
received oral health care. And that's a point across all of these topics of um, co-occurring um, co -occurring health outcomes and, um, you know, focusing, we could bring in behavioral health during pregnancy. We could bring in healthy eating, active living, low birth weight, newborns, and food deserts. And then again, tying this discussion back to access to care and the, with the number of individuals who use the emergency department as the first continuum of care. Any other comments for, for prenatal and infant care? Right. I, I just came on. I had one comment, and that's about documenting um, during pregnancy uh, the person's perception of their support network. You know, who's in it? How often do they interact with people in that network? Um, and obviously, what happens if they don't have a social support network? Is there is there support services that can fill that gap? Sharon. All right. And next, we're going to move into substance use and behavioral health. So I know there have been some ideas that were shared in the previous slides. If anyone wants to summarize their ideas and add anything new. I added here from our discussion yesterday with the Behavioral Health Advisory Group, um, one of their initiatives is specifically advocating for behavioral health screenings during annual well visits. And so um, taking a look at that for both youth and adults. We have behavioral health programs, both inpatient and outpatient support. Taylor, can I jump in on that comment that you just shared from the Behavioral Health Group? Yes. I don't, I don't know how to make it an indicator, but I will just tell you when I went for my annual primary care visit, the medical assistant who's like just looking at the laptop says to me, are you depressed? I said, no, she wrote no and we'll move on. <laughs> so I worry a little bit about what that actually means to have a screening, you know, to say like that would be our indicator, you know, because I, I think that a lot of those uh, behavioral health screening questions are pretty pro forma in practice. So I'm not sure how to suggest that as an indicator, but I would be concerned if it just got reduced to a question like that. 
Yes, and that's what the BHAG, that's what they've been working on, um, creating a more comprehensive questionnaire that uh, asks more than just one question. Um, and so, so they're taking a look deeper at that. And there are some, they, amongst adolescents specifically, there are more questions. And so um, for that group, they brought up the, um, the screening specifically for, for teens. Oh, and Dr. Bauer, you're on mute. Oh, yeah, even using the word depression, right? And you, they, you know, is can be an, an issue. So yeah, I'm glad I'm glad they're they're uh, working on that because I was just shaking my head when that happened. I thought if somebody really needed help, this is not the way to to identify that. So have a number of primary care providers who manage patients on behavioral health meds. Behavioral health screenings for postpartum women. Non-prescription substances to address mental health. Number of days of diagnosis to being seen by a provider. And overall, the utilization of um, various mental health resources across the county. Now with the Dire Crisis Care Center now open, um, you know, seeing their utilization in their in their first their first weeks, seeing the utilization of 988, as Dr. Maurer mentioned. Um, and then also um, the work group yesterday suggested the state is focusing on public behavioral health services, but then also uh, focusing on the use of private behavioral health services and partnering with our local behavioral health authority. And everything surrounding 988 who have heard of it know why to call. And so I know that they have specific measures um, on completed calls that when when folks did call in that they were that they knew what 988 was for versus folks who are utilizing the hotline who may not know what it is for. Rates of alcohol impaired driving deaths. Are there any other substance use measures that we're not considering? I know some of our comments were focused on behavioral health, but any additional substance use? Will this be separated out by adult and adolescents, or is this all going to be grouped together? We'll we'll separate it. DUI arrest. Opioid awareness and Narcan training and the availability of Narcan. Our behavioral health division within the health department is actually undergoing an asset mapping initiative of uh, Narcan resources across the county. So I'll be very curious to see um, to see what platform they they land on using for that asset map and see how we can integrate that in the community health assessment as well. All right, and any other suggestions for substance use and behavioral health? Access to mental health, first aid, training programs. All right. Next, we are going to 
discuss preventative screenings and vaccines. And so here, this is something that um, we may also consider breaking up. So if anyone has any uh, suggestions about um, things to focus in on or um, what we should give specific mention to and make sure to highlight in, in the CHA from your experience in Prince George's County. adolescent vaccine schedules. The state also, they just conducted a call this morning and it had, uh, they included data on Prince George's County and um, and uh, the, and how many uh, families and how many youth are following those vaccine schedules. So it's coming, it's all coming full circle on this Thursday. Post COVID vaccines. Yeah, that was something that the state actually noted that there was a dip in those um, adherence to the vaccine schedules during during the pandemic um, out of uh, family fears for taking their um, for taking their children to to those physicians and taking them into doctor's offices. Proportion of county residents counseled about vaccine eligibility at their most primary care visit, rate of HCV vaccine. Proportion of county residents where vaccines available at community pharmacies. Seniors who receive age specific vaccines. One of our areas that we focus in on are our aging populations. So that will be that'll be something that we can dive deeper into. And again, discussion of the available resources and the partners who are currently providing services. All right. Well, just taking a look at the clock here, I just want to um, thank everyone for all of your active engagement and participation today. Um, before we jump into our community announcements, did anyone have any additional reflections, um, any indicators that we didn't discuss today or any um, areas that we need to consider, especially as we consider um, the uh, um, advancing through the quantitative data collection piece. Dr. Bauer. I suggest considering some digital divide questions given that the state is making big investments in broadband access, getting people digital devices, um, you know, that's being led by our colleagues, mainly in cooperative extension, but I know there's so many other groups that work on that issue. But I mean, cooperative extension got a lot of resources from the state to um, hold training workshops, to disseminate uh, devices, right, to help get people online. And I think it would be, I mean, you know, there might be a lot of assumptions about Prince George and Prince George's as a semi-urban suburban county that that's not really an issue, but my guess is it is. And it really goes to people's ability to access any online information and services. So uh, I think some questions about the 
you know, digital divide, digital access could be very important. I know we've had conversations about within that access to care umbrella uh, discussing telehealth and barriers to telehealth. So that could be a section where we talk more about the digital divide. Any any other thoughts before we close out the interactive portion? I don't see any other comments or hands raised, Taylor. Thank you very much. I'm just going to move us quickly into our community announcements. Great. So first, uh, to put on folks' radar, this Saturday at the Reed Temple Church is the Mental Health Symposium. Um, in, in recognition of Suicide Prevention Month here in September, uh, this event will be taking place starting at 10 a.m. on Saturday, and I will include a link in the chat for registration. I have a bunch of links for folks. Next, next Thursday, uh, September 26th at 11 a.m., our community care coordination team, I mentioned them today, they are having a meeting with um, a bunch of community partners. Um, their work group is attempting to streamline care coordination in Prince George's County, so working with the community health workers again um, to see how are they making referrals for care, how are they engaging? Um, how are they engaging clients, and how are they connecting them to resources? What are those barriers? And so, a uh, community resource inventory that the CCCT has um, started navigating is Find Help. It was previously called Aunt Bertha for those who are um, aware of Aunt Bertha. And so, next Thursday during the meeting, we are asking for community partners to join the CCCT and discuss um, and to actually look through and to see if your organization's programs are listed in Find Help. And if they're not listed in Find Help, uh, to list your programs uh, in that inventory, but then to also recruit, recruit some of the partners that you work with in the community so we can build a more comprehensive um, community resource inventory and to um, get resources added so they are more accessible and available to our CHWs who are in the field, but then also community members who use Find Help to find uh, geographically tailored resources. So that meeting again is available to all of our work groups. That's next Thursday at 11 a.m. And next, uh, Hispanic for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, our partners are having several activities at uh, Parks and Planning, and I put the link in the chat for you all to visit their calendar. Um, as you can see, there are a few more opportunities coming up. I believe they are taking place weekly, so this Sunday coming up on the 22nd, and then next, uh, the following weekend on the 29th. Uh, this specifically is the uh, Hispanic Heritage Month Tour, so they have uh, reduced rates. Um, in recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month and several other free events to the community. So feel free to check out their calendar to see more events available. Um, next, our partners are having the Communities in Action Advancing Health Equity Through Systems Change Annual Summit. This is taking place on Friday, October 18th at the Maryland Innovation Center starting at 8.30 a.m. So if you are interested in participating in the event, if you're interested um, in participating as either a vendor or as a participant, you can scan the QR code or I put the link in the chat and you can sign your organization up to represent your organization or to again, uh, go as an individual. 
and this is hosted by our friends over at Community Engagement and Consulting Group. They previously gave a presentation to the Health Equity Work Group, so very excited to see this summit happening. Next, MedStar is hosting a senior health and wellness fair. This is taking place on November 23rd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. For folks interested, um, we have an email address here and a phone number if your organization is interested in joining the event. Um, I put that contact information in the chat and I will be sure to send this out in the meeting notes as well. And lastly, for those who were unable to attend our coalition meeting last Tuesday, our coalition is being renamed. So um, during the past two coalition meetings, uh, folks have offered um, uh, name suggestions as well as um, some core values to the coalition that have been used to uh, to decide on three name choices. So uh, voting will close on Monday, September 30th, but there are three name choices that folks can choose from. So choose your preferred name choice. And again, uh, send this out to your networks for anyone who isn't here today, who is within the coalition and hopefully come October 1st, we will have a new coalition name. And so you can scan the QR code or you can go to that link that I have included in the chat and I'll make sure to include this in the meeting notes as well. And those are all of our community announcements, but um, everyone who is still sticking with us on the call, anything uh, folks wanna add, any upcoming events or announcements? Yes, this is Amira from the Department of Family Services and the Aging and Disabilities Services Division. We are hosting a caregiver conference on Wednesday, September 25th. It is free for attendees. Uh, it'll go from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And it'll be at Martin's Crosswinds in Greenbelt. So I will include a link um, that you can use yourself or to disseminate to your networks. It's for family caregivers and community caregivers. And Amir, if, uh, would you mind if I can connect with you later on something separate? Sure, that's fine. Okay. Do you have my, is, is our contact information readily available in the chat or readily available on the platform? It isn't, but I can ask Taylor if, um, <laughs> if you don't want to drop it in. No, I'll drop it in. I was just. All right, thanks it. so much. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Does anybody else have any other community announcements? Well, thank you, Taylor, for leading a really dynamic working session. Um, I think all, we know all this work is really important. Um, thank you for including us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Next, not next week, not next week, next month. <laughs> so thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.